Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends, as the great ELP once sang. This is episode 215 of Two Legs. We are mainly a Paul McCartney podcast featuring the solo career of Paul McCartney. And joining us today is the co-founder of Two Legs, Mr. Tom Hunyadi. Hello, Tom. Andy, my friend, it's great to be back doing another show with a fantastic with a, person. Yeah, we're doing our, our returning guest, uh, his fourth mm. episode back on Two Legs, and that is Mr. Owen Ling, all the way from Ireland. Hello, Owen. Well, I'm actually in Ireland, so I don't know if I'm all the way from Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> well, to the Yank, to the Yanks watching this show, they're going to be like, oh, he's in Ireland. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God, you're in Dublin. My great-great-grandfather's dog came from Dublin. I mean, I'm totally Irish. Oh, that's a good American accent. I like that. Was good. Like, well, that it's, was. It's, I, I get it nearly every day here. It's like, oh my great great, he came from this little place called Yogo. It's called Y'all. Oh, God. Y'all. <laughs> well, Owen, Owen, it's great to have you back. Owen is the uh, author of the uh, book that came out in what twenty twenty two. George Harrison in the seventies, twenty twenty two, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah awesome. Yeah, I, I, I I don't know what month it came out in 2022 because of COVID. There was a there was a delay in yeah. in I, I think I got my copy in like May 22. Well, okay. it's a pleasure having you back. Owen is a, a freelance author and journalist. He has written for Culture Sonar, Far Out Magazine, Penny Black Music, and a host of others. And uh, again, this uh, this great book here in which he lit a little fire in the Beatles community with his opinion about extra texture, which I have to thank him for because it made me reevaluate the record. So good yeah. on you. Thank you. Yeah, me and Mr. Mayo, when I did the show with Tom Hanyadi on Talk More Talks, he seemed pretty yeah. perplexed by that one. And he was like, but what yes. you got to <laughs> think against 33 and a third? <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was a, hey, everybody has an opinion. And, 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 and yeah. you lit yeah. uh, a little bit of a spark for people to reevaluate the record. So good on you for doing that. Well, I, I think the musicianship is just outstanding yeah. on that record. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, and and it was refreshing uh, a refreshing break from the spiritualism, which was getting a bit haughty and a bit too much by that. After three mm. albums of of if you, if, you, if you don't follow God, you're doomed. You're right, it, it was good <laughs> to get a bit of a break from that. It certainly was. So yeah. the focus of today's show is going to be a kind of the first of a new series, uh, kind of one that we did with Anthony Rotuno back uh, in the last couple of years. Mm. We did a multi-part episode on a John and Paul relationship. Mm. This is now going to be the first of at least we think three possibly more, on the dynamic of the Paul and George relationship. And uh, I think it'll be at least definitely, three episodes. Uh, yeah, it's definitely a unique re- relationship as well. I mean, we're going to start in 69, but they're, I mean, obviously the relationship goes you know, well, way, way back. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, we could go back to, we could go back to speak and, and stuff like that right. if you really want to go back to yeah. the, the 1950s. But um, we're really happy to have Owen on again to, you know, obviously he, you know, he's the man who wrote the book on George Harris in the 70s. And we've never really done a Paul deep dive into Paul and George as a relationship mm-hmm. throughout. And again, it'll be interesting to see how this kind of goes throughout the decades, right? Mm-hmm. Because obviously in the 80s, there's not as much contact, but there's some, mm-hmm. obviously. So, you know, Owen, what are your initial thoughts on a Paul and George dynamic relationship through the course of the rest of George's life from 1970 on? Well, as with every relationship, it's good to start with 69. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get that dirty joke out of the way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It seems to be pretty good for a lot of it. I mean, you look at the photos from Abbey Road, they're having a blast. Yes. Yes. You look at yes. them recordings, here comes the sun, and they've yeah. both got these yeah. massive smiles. Can we edit that, yeah. what, that that photo of the two of them? Like, Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. fair enough. This, the photo that Owen's talking yeah. about, you'll see right now. Okay. <laughs> like magic. So, yeah, you yes. can see, that does not look like two people who, you know, can't stand each other's company. That looks like two people who are caught in the moment creating a really lovely track. Although I think Here Comes the Moon is a better track. Uh... Oh, <laughs> wow. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair Here enough. we go. Uh, yeah. and he, they've also created something together, which is George's finest hour. Uh, mm. I, I, I mean, I mean, if, uh, I, I don't think you can argue with something being a masterpiece. I think that. that oh, no, if, not at all. Yeah. Uh, I th- John Lennon called it the finest track on the album, and I think I'd agree with him. Yeah. Mm. I mean, you know, so you've got that. I mean, you want to start it back really kind of just with the, the January 6th, 1970, when George just quits mm-hmm. with their little conversation. I mean, it's really where everybody kind of thinks the, the, the breaking point starts 
with the relationship with the two of them, you know, with the as we now saw in a cleaned up version by Peter Jackson in Get Back. But I think that little row that they had uh, right. in the context of the original Let It Be film is so. I mean, now that we've seen the full documentary, mm. it's such a minute thing that was yeah, blown right. up into would be such a huge thing <clears throat> that kind of def what many people defined their relationship like throughout the 1970s just because yeah. of that one little you know conversation and it's such a and it's such a calm relaxful conversation i mean you can tell there's like a just a scent a, you know, a scent of cynicism from 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 george or 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 whatnot but it's like you mm -hmm. know you watch that documentary and even when they're disagreeing, there's no yelling, right? There's no raising voices or anything like that throughout that whole month, which I find fascinating. Yeah, I do. I, but I, watching the Peter Jackson show, I was a little bit more on George's side when you've got Paul going, mm. uh, do you remember when we recorded Hey Jude? Mm. And I was, right. I said we shouldn't use the guitar solo. And it's like, oh, mm. fuck off, Paul. I can yeah. <laughs> it really is like him, Paul, whether Paul is intending it or not, he's rubbing it in saying, oh, do you remember that time we had this huge hit and you wanted a guitar solo? Right. And I said, no, that's a silly idea. Maybe you should listen to me. It's a bit smug. <laughs> <laughs> Always with those call and response guitar licks. God, it, it went right. on for decades, but George finally got his way on um, <laughs> real love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we'll see if there's any kind of guitar lick and call and response on now and then. We'll see. We'll have to see when that one comes out. Possibly. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I doubt it. It's such a it's such a it's such a funereal dirge like song. I can't imagine the the Threedles adding so much to that track to make it lively yeah. and enjoyable what do you what are your what are your quick have... thoughts on now and then just before we continue jumping into the timeline i'll wait till i hear the finished product but if, if george didn't think it was good enough in 96 i don't know why it's good enough in 23 <laughs> sorry mm. yeah. i'm sorry no i mean you make yeah. a good point i mean i it, it's it's paul that really has the you know yeah. the you know the the nerve or the I was, I was gonna say hard on but <laughs> to get to get the get to get it done you know but uh but going back to the yeah going back to the 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 uh george and paul i mean to have yeah. that the main focus of like you know i mean that's any everything that usually people talk about it's this big argument that that george and paul mm -hmm. had which is not mm -hmm. nothing you know until you see it you know, there, there's nothing there, really. It's just two people having, uh, you know, a, you know, which a, a, an unheated discussion about, you know, how to play or what to play. Which yeah. you can tell when, when you heard that little private, secretly recorded conversation, you know, John was basically saying, like, look, look, we've been holding him down. Yeah, <laughs> right. Basically, the genesis of that conversation, which, thank God, right. was secretly recorded. And was, again, with that right. MAL technology where Peter was able to reduce all the you know the, right. the noises to be able to hear and basically they, they were both saying that you know we've got to give them space to breathe which was my take on that conversation what do you yeah. think owen yeah I, I think that too uh, also jo len was pointing out to mccartney that, that george's he he highlighted george's importance on she said she said which is effectively a, a harrison lennon composition that he that he says something to tune up i gave it to george because he knew where to take it well, as if you would have done too much with it <laughs> And it's just, yeah. it's just sometimes Paul could be too heavy handed and he would change a track to the point where it's unrecognizable. She said, she said, it's just, it's just balls out rock. It didn't need like, I mean, lots of melody and ornamentation and mm. yeah. So, so you were of the belief that Paul is not playing bass on she said, she said. I'm not saying that. I, I, <laughs> I, because I, I don't know. I, I genuinely don't know either way. Uh, I, I, yeah. I, it, it could be Paul saying, "Oh, uh, that's that's a really bad baseline." Oh, that was George. Um, right. <laughs> more, than, more than likely, he recorded the baseline and then stormed out. And they said, "Will we re-record?" And they were like, "No, it's fine. We'll just leave it as is." Yeah, yeah. it's just interesting that the the relationship between these two it goes back before Lennon. You know, th though these guys were buddies, were you know, th th he knew George before John Lennon, so. The fact, you know, and I know he was obviously a little bit, a little bit younger. Obviously, he was much younger than Lennon, a year younger than Paul. But yeah. these guys knew each other from way, way back. So to 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 see that they were like friends early on, and then obviously John and Paul become the focal yeah. point of the Beatles, and he's this kind of junior member. And then yeah. as the decade goes on, I mean, this is the guy that he's known really the longest. When you mm -hmm. think about it, it's like even when he when he passed away, he said he's my yeah. baby brother. So when you think mm -hmm. about the trajectory yeah. of their relationship from beginning to end and how mm -hmm. it was kind of 
put us pushed to his side, even though they knew each other the longest, is sad and happy at the same time. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Uh, yeah, not much I can add to that. Uh, but uh, I, I do turn back to a, a quote Patty Boyd made where she said to, I think it was, it was the, the author of Behind That Locked Door where she said, I don't think mm. they really loved mm. each other. And then she went, I shouldn't have said that. But, oh, wow. Yeah, mm. that's a very important, pertinent point, point of the book where she says, I don't think they really loved each other. And then she went, maybe I shouldn't have said that. Mm. I, I think they did, you know, despite all the BS, I mean, at the end mm. of the day. But it's, you know, we're going to go through it as we, as, as, mm. as we go through here the timeline. Uh, September uh, of, let's see, well, yeah, George writes, why, 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 right yeah. after that quit, you know, and, um, yeah. you know, really kind of fitting, you know, throwing the, you know, throwing the Mickey, taking the Mickey out of Paul and the rest of the Beatles on Wawa. And really a lot of stuff on All Things Must Pass with, you know, isn't it a pity? <laughs> really. Right. I mean, when you think about the yeah. demise of the Beatles. Yeah. 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 Uh, but Wawa is just such a fiery track. And they, I actually, I would have, I would, I would swap one after nine and nine for a performance of Wawa on the roof. I'm going to say that. <sighs> oh. Yeah. Could you imagine? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> bow, bow, bow. And the oh, three of them yeah. coming together. And the three of them coming together. Wow, 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 wow. Wow. Well, how, <laughs> how poetic is this? You've got Wawa at the end of the concert for George with Paul playing on it and singing yes. it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. So this song was mainly written about me, but here I am now jamming on it and screaming wah wah and, <laughs> on the piano. Yeah. <laughs> He's um, He's the ultimate PR man, as jo as John Lennon said. He, yeah, yes. yeah, he, he yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, do, 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 do. September September ninth, yeah. uh, George, Paul, and John meet at Apple Corp, where Paul says, "quote I think that until now, until this year, our songs have been better than George's." <laughs> and it's important to remember that this is the meeting that takes place before mm -hmm. John's "I Want a Divorce." I mean, yeah. this is after the, the 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 concert, you know, the live piece Toronto. Mm -hmm. um are this i'm sorry this is before that you know so they're still talking about what they're going to do next i mean abbey road has yeah. been recorded right so they're, they're talking about this is the meeting where where john suggests that you know john paul and george do four songs each um you know so i mean the, i i would think that this is this is up for 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 george and then here comes paul with his you know <laughs> his 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 quote that that annie just you know just read off yeah Kinda. which he said in front of him yeah. In front of him. <laughs> yeah. Like, I could see if that was a meeting between John and Paul. He right. says right in front of him, right. yeah, our songs have been better than yours. Yeah. You suck. Like, what? Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. not his finest hour. I remember Mark Lewison at one of his talks a few years ago read that quote, and there was a big, <gasps> and he went, okay, right. okay, but remember, you got to admire the fact these guys feel they can talk to each other this way. Right. Right. And there, this is that of course, legendary 15-minute tape, which I've heard about two right. minutes of. Uh, I heard, you know, and it's awesome but i uh, hopefully we hear the whole thing have you heard some of that uh, tape oh or the whole thing just the bits that mark lewison played that yeah. his yeah I, I've, I've read the transcript i haven't heard it yeah mm -hmm. some some somebody has that recording somewhere and i cannot yeah. believe that it has not surfaced the whole thing the whole 15 minute of the, of the recording which they recorded to give to ringo of course because he was ill yeah. right yes so, uh, right right yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, it's a very telling interview. I mean, uh, John Lennon says that Maxwell's and oh bloody oh blah da. Right. No, no one rated them, and, right. and Paul says, "Yeah, I didn't think much of them either." And it's like, you're already. Why are you knocking your own material? And two, if you didn't think much of them, why did you record? Them? Yeah. Why did you? Yeah. Why did we do a hundred takes? Both. Of them? Yeah. Right. I can imagine. Mm. I can yeah. imagine George wanted to throw a chair at Paul at that point where he says, yeah. "I didn't think much of Maxwell Silver Hammer." Boom. And, and you know, to your point, where you know they were brave enough to talk to each other like the like the way they did. I mean, yeah. John has said something like, "Well, those are the songs that you should be giving to the Apple uh, yeah. signees." You know, and I mean, the, you Bad know, Finger, you the know, Ivies, the Bad Mary Fingers, Hopkin, and, you know, Hopkins. yeah, Marmalade. Yeah. yeah, right, <laughs> right. It's so, it's interesting brave, though, as as you as you go through it. You know, obviously, the twenty second of August in sixty nine is the last time all four Beatles are together. Even though after that September meeting. Mm -hmm. So they're pretty much John is pretty much checked out and done at that point, which brings yeah. us to the beginning of 1970, which is really the final Beatles session where yeah. um, Paul and George Ringo get together to do those overdubs for I Me Mine. Uh, and really, that's it. That's yeah. it after that. They're, they're done and they go their final ways. And, um, you know, I, 
I think it was more of just kind of a matter of, well, we've got to get together and just finish this up. I don't think it was like, well, are we going to keep going or not? Yeah. You know, what are your, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, as I, if I can plug my book, I, I, I think it was time when I said that the first Beatles song is Cry for Shadow and the last Beatles song is I Me Mine, and they're both written by George. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, okay. Lennon helped with "Cry for a Shadow" and McCartney helped with "I'm Me Mind," but they're ostensibly right. Harrison compositions. George tracks. Right. Interesting. Yeah. That, that's a very interesting take on it. With both Harrison, uh, right? Yeah, the first and the last one recorded yeah. for "I'm Me Mind." I mean, it's and it's slightly amazing that the three of them got back together at that point, given everything that had gone on. You know, to get back and just clean up. You know, "I'm Me Mind" because I think by this point the record was firmly in the hands of uh, Phil Spector, if not soon after. I think. Soon after, uh, I, perhaps they felt, perhaps perhaps they they prayed that Lennon might come back. Perhaps they they thought mm -hmm. up to the recording there session. There was there would right. I mean, there's 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 there was an interview with George where he said it would be selfish of mm -hmm. of them to not to continue uh, yeah. as, as as a band. So I I think there there was proof that they were there all three of them. You know, uh, Paul, George, and and Ringo that they were going to continue because you know as we know John. You know, changed his mind quite often. Yes. Uh, you know, he felt one way one day, and the next day he felt complete. You know, one day he yeah, was I'm, Jesus, uh, the I next know. day he was. I'm uh, Jesus. <laughs> well, yeah, and all, all dressed in white. And I, I think yeah. John yeah. really regretted a lot of what he said, which he did a lot all the way up until yeah. the end of his life. For sure, yeah. Um, I mean, he, he he told Whispering Bob, no, How Do You Sleep was about me. I'm, I don't know why me, people right. thought it was about Paul. Uh, because you, you talked about another day. You said, How Do You Sleep? You mentioned how uh, Sergeant Peppers. Right. <laughs> and again, you know, as if we needed any more evidence, of course, we'll, it's a little bit later in the timeline, but of course, George is on right. that track. So <laughs> if there was any need of need of alliance, we knew that... Uh, you know, Beetle. You know, Beetle George was going to help him out with that track. Yeah, Given, exactly. mm. you know, I think 1971. And we'll go, but 1971 really seems to be the. That seems to be the year that they really were all all disconnected in terms of yeah. really where they were yeah. at each other's throats. Post lawsuit, which is in February of 71, that's where they really were at odds with each other. Yeah. 72, a little thawing, and obviously 73 is where it came back as close as it could be. I would yeah. think. Mm. I think most yeah. people would agree with that. Um, yeah, I mean, t to mm. the point that when when they recorded that track for Ringo, "I'm the Greatest," uh, John Lennon said the only reason Paul's not on it is because he wasn't there. That was the only reason he's not mm. on it. If he was right. there, he would have played on it. He would have been yeah. on it, right? right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. jumping, mm. jumping, jumping back uh, into our timeline, we've got the 17th of March, 1970. Didn't realize this till Tom sent it. Paul attends the, a birthday party for Patty Harrison at mm. Friar Park and. Um, Peter Brown talks to Paul about promoting his upcoming album. So interesting right. here, you know, they're still yeah, going this together. Is where, right, this is where, you know, Paul realizes he has to promote the upcoming album, which comes out uh, in a few weeks later. And, um, you know, this and the, the conversations between them would, would continue. But, I mean, <laughs> the, the, the genesis of that, uh, you know, self-made interview was pretty much uh, you know, conducted at this at, at, at this birthday party, which is, again, you know, at this point in time, Paul hasn't, you know, come out and said, you know, I quit the Beatles, which he never did. <laughs> but uh, but, you know, that headline isn't out yet. So I, I could see still see some, you know, friendship there, um, mm. you know, between. So, you know, it, it still makes sense that Paul's invited to this birthday party because yet there, there's still yeah. no, you know, real, you know, back and forth hatred at the, at, you know. No, that would be coming in a few weeks. Ever... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah. But um, interesting uh, stuff. In a few weeks' time, it's um, you'll stay on the fucking label, Harry Krishna. Right. Yeah, like, yeah, you know. <laughs> that is. <laughs> yeah. That's just, that's just wonderful. Yeah. 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 That that's yeah. that 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 stuff is priceless, right? So then, obviously, a few right. weeks later, the famous famous moment where Ringo goes around to Paul's house and says, yes. um. Look, you can't. Your yeah. album can't come out now. Uh, let it be first, and Paul slams the door right on Ringo's face. Yeah, of course, yeah, Ringo. It, yeah, yeah. He says to Ringo, "Get your coat and get out." <laughs> right. Like uh, in the anthology, he's like, uh, "There's only one person I've kicked out of my house, and unfortunately, it was Ringo, who's like the nicest guy ever." <laughs> Funny that John and George didn't have the gumption to do it themselves. They fetched, you know, poor Ringo, who who doesn't want to piss anybody off. You yeah, go cowardly. do it. It was cowardly. Of yeah. Him. Come on, man. John or George should have been like, yo, brother, yeah. hold off on your freaking album. Yeah, we you, hold off on it. We all know you're going to outsell Ringo. 
give give the guy a chance. You know, you know. <laughs> you're all we're saying is give Ringo a chance, right? <laughs> but, right. So after all that crap, the Beatles relent collectively and let Paul have his April release date of, of McCartney of nineteen from for April, and they yeah, push right. let it be back till May. Yeah. After all that, so you know, Paul got his way, yeah. and much you know, which I mean, if I don't know if that was a case of the Beatles just saying screw it, let him have his day. Or Probably. we just don't want to deal with it. Uh, it probably was. It's just too much work. And it's just like, oh, he's being, oh, Paul's just being, oh, just let him have it. It probably mm. was just that. So uh, Paul's album comes yeah. out. And then we, we get George uh, input and feedback on what he thinks of uh, the McCartney album. And the mm. question was, I guess you've heard Paul's album. What do you think? George says, well, quote, I thought that would be something. And maybe, maybe I'm amazed or great. Everything else I think is fair. It's quite good, but a little disappointing. So there's George's mm. first recorded uh, take on the McCartney album. Well, that's right. what everyone from that time has said, that the, when they got the McCartney album, they just were like, that's it? <laughs> I mean, in, in, the, in the grand scale of things, it, you could see that it's him piecing his life back together. It's something diaristic. Right. It's, you know, it, before he plunges into Ram and Band on the Run, which are these big, ornate, symphonic pieces, he needs to just mm. dabble at home and just play play some drums and just... Am I, am I speaking too loud? No, you're great. No, okay. you're great. And, uh, yeah. no, oh, thank you. I know. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I mean, even Mark Lewis in an, on a, in an interview with Nothing Is Real, he said, he said, oh, that was so disappointing. And Ram, so disappointing. And those early sing wing singles, so disappointing. He said, we wanted Band on the Run to be good, and it was good. I know. It's just, you know, I think the expectations between the two of them, especially with their first mm -hmm. respective solo records, they just both had to kind of go in different directions. Paul wanted yeah. to build it back up, and George was like, I got 30 songs I've been sitting on for five years. I got to get them out. See you later. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and interesting, obviously, George's first solo LP comes out the 27th of November, 1970. The triple album, well, really a double if you want to count the Apple Jam, but which you have to, but I really, it's... You know, I'll be honest, I don't listen to the Apple Jam all that much. It's a double LP. Mm -hmm. Come on. You're going to listen to, you know, I Remember Jeep, Owen? Come on. Yes, yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. Actually, it was very comforting to me in the last weeks when I was editing the book that you could have these, you know, these wonderful guitar hooks and you're, and you're like, yeah, let's go. And you're like, <laughs> and you're like yeah. No, I, I, I genuinely, I genuinely really like the third album and I like the way that it's, it was done as a, as a separate entity that if you didn't want to listen to it, you didn't have to. You'd right. have so it, to. So it's not like, say, some of the White Album tracks, like it's like a Wild Honey Pie or just some of this nonsensical stuff where you're just like, I don't want to listen to it, but, but I have to. Right, yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Whereas yeah. with the third, you have the option to not play it. There's some, you know, it's Johnny's birthday, which is interesting. I remember John's quote at the time, you know, what's he, Crackers putting three records out? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't have an issue with Yoko putting out a double album. No, <laughs> but... Yeah. Multiple, multiple double albums. <laughs> Don't even get me started. Multiple double albums, <laughs> and Paul can't get one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, but we need, to, we need to get Adrian back on the show for that. <laughs> we do, we do. Um, but an interesting lyric uh, song in in All Things Must Pass, Run of the Mill that we have here in our notes. Yeah. Which you you find as a song, Tom or Owen, kind of slightly yeah. unveiled to, to McCartney. No one around you will love you today. Throw it all away tomorrow when you rise. Another day for you to realize me, you know, or send me down again. I mean, I think those are kind of directed, you know, little jabs. Yeah, directed, directed to Paul. I th I think it's at all. I think it's at everyone in the Beatles. It's just you know the whole everything yeah. is falling apart and and uh, I mean this there's this revisionistic nonsense that George. George was unfazed by the Beatles' breakup. If he's writing something as stunningly, achingly beautiful as Run of the Mill, you can see the heartbreak. Right. Right. Yeah. You've got yeah. me wondering how I lost your friendship, but I see exactly. it in your eyes. Yeah. You know, though I'm beside you, I can't carry the lame for you. <laughs> yeah, I can't carry you know? the blame for you. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and, yeah. And especially when he sings, can't carry the... You can hear the, the quiver yeah. in the voice, and the, it sounds yeah. to me like he's holding back. He's fighting back tears. It does. Yeah. It's a beautiful track, and whatever George wouldn't say publicly in words, he can yeah. convey in his words and his music, and you can hear that clearly, clearly in a song like "One of the Mill." You know, he may not right. be lovey-dovey openly, but he, you know, his pain is his pain, and what his feelings are, what he's, it's in the music. You can hear it. Yeah. Is all you just said. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you... at your own made end with no one but yourself to be offended. It's it's you that decides. 
I, yeah. I love how that ends, you know, lyrically. Yeah. But I, on the McCartney album, we have Man, We Was Lonely, and those lyrics get quite biting towards the other Beatles. Mm. Uh, mm. Let me, if I can just get the lyrics up right now. Please, yeah. yeah. He was lonely. You know, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, everyone has songs a that I thought were mine alone. Yeah. You know, alone. But now we're fine all the way. Used to ride on the city fast city lane, singing songs I thought were mine alone, alone. Right, yeah. Now let me lie with yeah. my love for the time. I am home. 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 Yeah. And home. then and then and we was hard pressed to find a smile. Mine we was lonely. I mean that's mm. if you're hard pressed to find a smile in the greatest band on earth, that does show you're fairly <laughs> miserable. Yeah. Mm. I mean the opening yeah. lyric of mm. Run in the Middle just tells you exactly, you know, everyone has a choice. What you know. When yeah. to or not to raise their voices, it's you that decides. If that yeah. if that wasn't clearly saying, you know, where he was at with it, uh, you know, that's, so that's a key track on that album. I think everybody would agree. Run of the Mill is yeah, right. definitely one of the best ones on the whole yeah. L of the LP. It's uh, one of the best. Yeah, and then it's one, you... sorry, go ahead, Owen. Go ahead. It's one of the best songs any any Beatle released. I agree. Beatle... I agree. I agree. You know, and then you also, as we talked about, isn't it a pity where he then you know adds the you know the call and response with the guitar. Uh, you know, showing Paul that hey, it can be done. <laughs> you know, it's you know uh, what a brilliant move. Is, I, what a, what a brilliant move yeah. by Peter Jackson to include that song at the <laughs> end of part one of the documentary with the three Beatles huddled up. How like was that not one of the best ways to end it? You've got the the picture of the three Beatles huddled up. George is gone, and they're playing. It's, they're playing. Isn't it a pity? As the credits roll, yeah. yeah. That was like a goosebump moment when when you watch that documentary. Yeah. I mean, he he did admit himself. It's a bit of directorial interpolation on his part, but it, it it just sums everything up. That like, I mean, you the the breakup is on the on the horizon, and they're all feeling miserable at this moment in time. Mm, right. And then yeah. I mean, I know we're we're going back a little bit, but that that I mean, that, that great, wonderful part. And I've been getting the second episode when Paul and Ringo are just sitting oh, there. Yeah. You know, when Paul just says, and then there were two like fighting yeah. back the tears. Mm. And the and and then Ringo is in tears, looking at him. Yeah. yeah. I shouldn't laugh. It's very sad. It's a very no, sad but moment. that that was a like that was like a holy crap moment. That yeah. was a holy crap moment watching it's, that documentary. Yeah, it's the moment where they realize we are going to break up, and all we can do is delay it. And that's that that, yeah. that that's the reason why it got such an emotional reaction from the audiences because you could everyone could see that they know it's going to happen, and it does happen. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, all right, moving ahead here, December of nineteen seventy, Paul and George meet in New York. Paul yeah. says, I want out of the Beatles. George says, no, citing tax complications. Can you enlighten us a little bit on that? Well, that was that was more of a Klein thing. Um, yeah. You know, as, as we know, Paul, uh, you know, wants out. I think this was his final final straw uh, mm. before he, he, you know, he gave the OK for his, you know, his brother in law to go ahead with the uh, lawsuit with the, with the lawsuit of, of, you know, suing the uh, the other three. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think he really felt that. Um, you know, by going to to George with this, and you know, and having a conversation that maybe, yeah. uh, you know, it would have been possible for him to to get out. But yeah, but with 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 uh, George and John being so firmly connected uh, to Klein, still at this point, you know, I I, I really believe that they thought that uh, it was their best interest to have Paul uh, still on the label because obviously, yeah. look, business is business. So, I mean, Paul is a money maker, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, um, uh, as they pointed out, that My Sweet Lord was a monster hit, and Paul didn't have a monster right. hit on his own as a solo artist. Right. So he, I mean, it, it's almost altruistic of George to say, why don't you stay on the label and you can share some of my money? Right. Right. Like, yeah. Yes. So, Interesting. I mean, I, it was pointed out to Paul that the biggest hit at that point was My Sweet Lord, was my sweet and, Lord. and he was missing out on that revenue. He, he didn't have, a, at that point, he didn't have a hit to, to match My Sweet Lord. Or even, or even, it don't come easy. I think it's by that oh, point. Yeah. No, that was that not out yet. No, that was wasn't out yet. No, right, that, yeah. that wasn't out yet. That was seventy one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But it is very. I mean, was George the one saying? Was do we know if George was the one who told him? No, you can't get out of this right now. Or was right. that more of yeah, a Klein this was thing? yeah, that was George. Yeah, well, I mean, it was it's Klein's suggestion. I mean, this is you know a lot of what what George was saying then what, about the tax uh, complications that that came from that came from Klein. And it so, did. And I mean, I obviously, mean, you've seen that correspondence right. between even Lennon and McCartney. John, John always says, what about yeah. the tax? What about the tax? Yeah. Like, right. you know, sign bits of right. piece of paper and just say that Paul just wants us to just sign pieces of paper and say, you know, but what about the tax? So and which was a right. valid question, which yeah. right, which will, will end up being kind of ironic because, you know, with with Klein helping with concert from Bangladesh, it's it's Klein who screws up the, the wrong tax. Uh, yes. Um, 
write off that, yes. that doesn't allow the money to go where it needs to go. Which, yeah. so. which was a pity. <laughs> yeah. Which oh, was yeah. a pity. <laughs> and, and that right. soured things for Harrison and Klein. And by 1973, Klein is out. Right. Yeah. Klein but before out. we get yep. there, so we've got the the big end of the year. Paul finally formal, yep. you know, sues John, George, and Ringo on the 31st mm-hmm. of December 1970 with the high court. And the um, the lawsuit begins in February of 71, which was the same day that Paul released Another Day, um, co- <laughs> yes. you know, which, which, you know. No, was... no, it wasn't the same day. That that would that would be then the February one. So it's. No, no, it's it's I jumped. I just jumped ahead. Oh, I jumped you ahead jumped. In February. Okay. I ju- Said the lawsuit right, now right. in February. Yeah. That, you know that's when the, the court, yeah. the trial begins, yeah. and um, they all give their their quotes to the court. George says, "Quote to get a peaceful life, I always had to let Paul have his own way, even when it meant that songs of mine weren't being recorded at the same time. I was helping Paul record his own songs, and into the bargain was having to put up with him having to tell me how to play my own instrument." <laughs> 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 that's George at to, uh, a quote, you know, in, directly, right. you know, to the court. Yeah. But but he has he said things kind of said things like that too, you know. After that, so it's just I think that's the first time something like that comes out, um, you know. And it's fact, right? I mean, as as we learn, you mm. know, about the band, you know, we've learned about you know how Paul is. He he is the conductor in the studio, right? He's yeah. you know conducting. He's suggesting you know what to play and what not. So yeah. this is I mean when you when you hear something like this, we we shouldn't be surprised by that statement. I think. Nope. Uh, yeah. Uh, Owen, would you agree that that kind of uh, Paul dictatorship type of running things really kind of started probably around Revolver or, or Pepper somewhere? And then where do you I'd think say, that happened? I'd say in Rubber Soul. I think that's when Jeff Emmerich says that that Paul always had a guitar by his side and he was making more demands and, and was acting mm. more like, if you don't play it my way, I'll play it myself. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting yeah. that, that he take yeah, that even as far back as Rubber Soul. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think, I mean, well, he, by that point, his arrangements are much more confident. I mean, we've got Drive My Car, we've got Michelle. I mean, he, he he's he's not he, he's talking to George Martin as a, as an equal rather than as as say his boss, and mm. he's much more so. That from what I understand, that's around, that's the time, <laughs> and on on Rubber Soul, he's playing a lot of the guitar solos. So I mean that must have been where the frustration started. Before that, he'd only played yeah. one guitar solo, which was another girl. Mm. Right, you know, and then just to see George evolve throughout this, you know, the late sixties, you know, you know, he says he learned to play chess on Sergeant Pepper because he just sat around, <laughs> and obviously, he, you know, he finds his groove there again in sixty eight and sixty nine with with yeah. great songs with "While My Guitar Gently Weeps" and something. Yeah. Um, but finally, you know, he. It's like it's like a spark went off with George where he finally was like, okay, I'm gonna up my game. And get back. He not that he was kind of putting the Indian stuff to the side, but clearly in '68 he was reinvigorated to you know, really kind of start you know kicking yeah. kicking ass with the songwriting and the and the producing. And it's just it's interesting to see had they continued where that would have evolved. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it was Ravi Shankar who told him, "Look, look, you don't have to. Right. Maybe it's time to let the sitar go. It's going to take decades, and right. you are a, you're a very fine guitar player. Why don't you focus on that instead?" So that right. that. And it's at that point that he rediscovers his love for guitar, and in when he realizes it's it's a bit too late for him to to match, say, a Clapton or a Jimmy Page, he just he goes for the slide guitar instead. Where he and there he re, that's an instrument he truly mastered, like he mm-hmm. was an, a sensational slide right. guitarist. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know, and uh, it's just interesting thinking about I bet all these those points in time where 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 they think where it could have gone had. Had they not split up, I mean, if Tom, no. like if they had done four songs, four songs, four songs, two songs, right? You know, right? We will, well, yeah. yeah, obviously, we'll, we'll never know. Yeah. Right. I'm, well, I'm, I, I think it was time for them to split. I think they, John and George, oh, had things they wanted to say that they couldn't say in the Beatles. John wants to sing about cold turkey. You can't sing that. We're the Beatles. George wants right. to sing about God. Yeah, we can't sing that. Say that. We're the Beatles. And I think even Paul during the Ram sessions felt like there's a lot of stuff I can do here I couldn't do with the Beatles. Mm. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. You know, going back to the to the lawsuit thing, I think, you know, with with Paul doing that, obviously, they're they're all their money, you know, freezes, right? And then, and in a way, that kind of you know, you know, bites him in the ass because now, you know, as him wanting to start this band up, I mean, he's unable to, you know, to do things that he wants to do, with, whether it's you know, offering um you know uh, royalties or or equal compensation i mean he's unable to do that now because a lot of his money 
is tied up. I mean, he's getting he's getting what was it like a monthly allowance from from EMI or or what or whatever, but or Apple or whatever. Apple. But but yeah. So I mean, he's unable to, you know, you know, treat this band, you know, financially the way or you know he would like to because of this lawsuit where which now freezes his money. So in a way, I mean, that kind of you know hurts him just as much as it's going to eventually help him. I think. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Um, so. Moving ahead here, we got to the summer of 71 and the aforementioned concert for Bangladesh, which I'm really surprised George even extended an invite to him, given what was going on. Right. And Paul flatly said, I'm not going to do it. And as John did as well. Yeah. Um, I, right. I think I think that was just a gentlemanly gesture. I, I, I think no one well, was happier than George that, that Paul McCartney right. declined the invitation. <laughs> right. Well, I think it. Well, and plus it came from Ravi. I mean, Ravi was going to do this on his own, but I think he then he realized with the with the power of his friendship with a Beatle, mm. right? Well, it's going to be a Beatle that's going to get more, even more, yeah. you know, funds or or help, you know, coming. Yeah. And then you know, George probably think, okay, well, if I have an equal, if I have a power, this this power to generate yeah. funds to help just think how many more gener uh, how many more funds i can generate by inviting you know a paul and a john as, of course as, as yeah well. i i mean yeah. pete townsend was told by bob geldof uh when 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 he asked uh, geldof why does who have to go back together geldof said listen fucker he said listen <laughs> listen to me every he says if you do this if the who plays will get a million quid every quid plays the life so do the fucking maths and then do the fucking show <laughs> For, yeah, you're, talking about for, you're talking about for Live Aid? Yeah, yeah, okay, for 1985. But, like, it's the same thing. Like, I mean, we'll make a lot more money and we're saving lives here. So put away your ego. Right. Yeah, put your, yeah, put, put your stuff away yeah. and just and just do it. Which, just, I, I, yeah. And naturally, I, you know, he, with the Klein still being in there, he doesn't hmm. want... He he goes if he, if I go there, all four of us play together, it's Klein that's going to take all of the, yeah. all of the, uh, the credit. Which, you know, I can see on yeah. Paul, you know, maybe... You know, we, yeah. we, we got we got this attitude towards Klein. We don't want him to have any credit whatsoever. And yeah. uh, so, unfortunately, it wasn't meant to be. I know. Um, I, th I I actually think Lennon came across worse in that era where where if Yoko can't oh. play, then he can't play. I mean, Paul, <laughs> right. if, if, if George had said, okay, it's you, not Linda, Paul would have said, okay, fine. That's, I'll that's do it. Deal. Yeah, right. I'll do it. Fine. Right. I'll yeah. do it anyway. Right. He, he would have apologized to Linda and said, sorry, this is how it is, but you know, it's still a charity gig. But with John, it's like, no, it's the two of us, or it's none of us. And it's like, yeah, but nobody's heard of Yoko Ono. You know, right. I'm sorry. You know, and can you can you imagine Yoko Ono on stage with Bob Dylan and Eric Clapton? No. No. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely just... not. Which is interesting, which takes us to our next point, the timeline, because John does say, you know, no, if I can't, Yoko can't do it, I'm not doing it. But then George plays on How Do You Sleep at uh, Tittenhurst anyway, you know, yeah. in, in September, you know, because well, the concert yeah. is in August. The concert's in August, and now he's there. Well, I'm trying to think. Well, those, no, those sessions would have been in Those sessions May. came before. Yeah, those sessions came before, before Bangladesh, before. Right. right. So, yeah, well, that yeah. was May of 71. The album came out in September, yeah. by which point. September, you know, right. Right. Yeah. But it's just, just in, oh, yeah. so they were still kind of, obviously, that was the alliance there, you know, but, but you know, to do now, it. I, I, th I think they had a good friendship until 74 which is when which is when you know John Lennon lets George Harrison down in so many ways and I think that is mm. what cuts the tie between those two mm, which yeah. really never really gets yeah. repaired sadly. I don't think so no uh, no no um but yeah so George plays on how do you sleep then really the 72 is really quiet obviously because Paul really is full on with wings at this point Focus. and and right. focused he's traveling all over Europe the university tour, obviously, in February of 72, and then all throughout Europe and the rest of 72, and three singles in 72. George is kind of putting together the, you know, still the putting, trying to get Bangladesh sorted out. And obviously, you know, you could speak to, you know, what was kind of 1972 for George, really, other than Material World and Bangladesh? Not much. I mean, he's giving, he had a car crash in 72, if I, if I remember correctly, which may have, and Paddy Boyd was badly injured in that car crash, which may mm. have... That may uh, that may have affected their marriage a bit. Uh, he's writing mm. songs for he what? I think in seventy two he recorded the track with Harry Nilsson. You're breaking my heart. I think that's mm. seventy two. Yeah, there, mm. I mean he, he was working with people, but he just and he was also work, working with Ringo around that time. Uh, mm. And he was and he was writing songs for his solo album. So I mean, he was keeping busy, but he wasn't. He just wasn't on the. He just wasn't following his celebrity as I, as 
to give a plug to Robert Rodriguez, I said this on something um, something about the Beatles. Uh, I said that it was probably a choice he made. He could have he could have been the solo Beatle had he had he right. followed the line he'd started with, uh, "All Things Must Pass" and Bangladesh. Mm. But if he'd had another like monster album in '72, there would have been no stopping him. Right. But he, take, but he takes 18 mm. months off from the public. Right. And he comes back with a much quieter album, and that's it for him. But do you obviously with the hugeness of an all things must pass, then jumping into a big charity project, you know, maybe he might have just, you know, the well might have been a little bit dry for him to come up with, with new material. Probably. Yeah, but um, he I, still has even as we learned from the all things must pass. I mean, we, we, we learned that he still had a wealth of material that he still didn't use yeah. for, for all things must pass. You know, um, no jumping into seventy three obviously is is his big, you know, his uh, living in the material world. Okay, as in uh, Owen's book here, which you. you know, a little plug for Mr. Ken Michaels. It's his favorite album of all time. Um, what are your initial <laughs> thoughts on living in the material world in the or oh, in, in the overall ranking of George Cannon? Where where do you put it? Well, I, I wrote a piece for Far Out about that George albums, and I, if memory serves me, it was fourth place. So I put Brainwashed, Extra Texture, and All Things Must Pass ahead of it. You did. Yeah. Um, you know, another low key record, very hugely religious, a lot of original, you know, let us speak it out, religious overtones, but with the big hit, Give Me Love, uh, as the, amazing. you know, as, as, as an amazing track, mm. which, which, you know, the B side, Miss Odell, um, it reveals an old phone number of Paul's at the end of it. What do you think? L little <laughs> I, dig? I, I think that's just a bit of fun. I, I think I think the bigger dig is the one is the dig he made about it. send send to Jim Jim Keltner on an elephant, <laughs> yeah, which was the, a dig the, which... yeah the back of the cover yeah yeah well what is yeah. that what is that line yeah. again uh, it was a it was a dig at Paul McCartney saying send to the Wings fan club he said send to the Jim Jim Keltner fan club well, on an well, elephant right. yeah right but things are starting to get a little warmer now which, right which, you know which you know Jim was not very happy about no yeah, Jim did yeah. not like that right no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, but but go I back mean, real quick to uh, Material World. Um, yeah. I mean, you have you know songs like "Sue Me, Sue You Blues," which is you know obviously you know about their you know the the, the court struggles you know with 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 Paul, and then you have you know the the track "Living in the Material World," which he does name na uh, name check Paul. You know met you know John and Paul here in the Material World. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so obviously Paul is still you know you know influencing. You know lyrics, uh, yeah. if you if you will, uh, in his music. Yeah, well, obviously, I mean, the, I mean, he was his oldest friend, wasn't he? They known each other since they were eight, nine years old. Right. I mean, yeah. uh, in a private conversation I had with Adrian Sinclair about four years ago, he described their their friendship as more like two brothers. So, like, I mean, it's there's the envy and the rivalry, and the mm -hmm. and the the fact that they do love each other, but it's just a bit harder to say it because they they're siblings, right? They're just yep. not going to say it, you know. Mm -hmm. And hey, yeah. Paul has said as much, you know. I think he says it in the in the doc in the Scorsese documentary. You know, you just didn't say that to each other, you yeah. know, growing up. He didn't he didn't express right. that, especially when you're growing up and egos and career. He didn't take a mm -hmm. moment to say, "Hey, man, I, I you know, I really yeah. like what you're doing here." It was too much, you know, too yeah. much macho, you know, ego stuff going on for them to do that. Yeah, I, I think it was easier for both of them to have a to say how much they loved John Lennon because he wasn't a family member. Effectively, they 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 knew him as a teenager. They knew him as this handsome sixteen year old mm. who was rebellious, who you know who could tell teachers to fuck off. He was smoking. He was drinking. He was just so cool. And, right, uh, and, they and worshipped him. Yeah, yeah. And Ringo was another one. Ringo was an adult. Mm. He was driving a car, and then he was dry. He was playing in Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, and they just saw this really cool dude. Whereas right. what Paul, Paul and George saw each other was two kids on a bus learning how to play guitar. Hmm. It's true. Mm. You, you know, mm. it really is. Mm. So like right around this time, Material World's out. The spring of 73, the Beatle buzz is all in the air. The Red and the Blue albums are out. Red Rose Speedway is out. Material World. All these albums are performing so well. Yeah. You know, number one singles, you know, Between My Love and then Give Me Love knocks Paul's number one out of the, the Billboard Top 100 in <laughs> June of 73. So it's it's... You know the the love is in the air, but the the Beatle records are selling uh, as they never have. And to it's that rivalry. Point. It's uh, well, yeah. Know. Yeah. And who who's the only one who's not doing so well? Lennon. John. Len mm -hmm. Lennon writes to Ringo Starr and says, "Can you write me a hit?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I mean, to, to, to you know, to come right out of the gate like Lennon did with Plastic Ono Band and Imagine, and then sometime in New York City, and then. 
the backlash from that. He had to dial it back. But still, you know, at the end of the year, had a top 10 single with Mind Games. Or top 40 single with Mind Games. Yeah, top 40, not top mm. 10. No, no. Mm. The, record, the record was top 10, though. I mean, I think it's like, number nine. Yeah. I, th- that can't have been great for his ego when everyone else in the Beatles is doing better than him. Right. Right. Every, every, and, and, you know, and obviously we've had panels and discussions about 73, but this point in time between Paul and George and the Red and the Blue albums, yeah. all competing for, you know, chart placement in the spring and the summer of 73, Give Me right. Love uh, knocks out Milo of the number one spot, you know. So yeah. you wonder you wonder if uh, George just had a little bit of a, you know, quiet chip on his shoulder and said, take that, you, you know. Well, I think... I- <laughs> I think George said he liked my love. I think I think I think it was John Lennon who slagged off my love. I think I, I think I remember George Harrison saying he thought it was quite a nice song. <laughs> right, but I I, I I doubt that he had he felt any remorse that uh, you know that his song you know knocks Paul's song off. No, I mean, no, like you said, not. I mean, there's still the rivalry there. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know. Oh God, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I mean, uh, I'm sure Paul was was thrilled when when in 1975 Venus and Mars is just knocking everything off and and when he's asked right. in 1975 would you consider a beetle reunion he's like no i don't see the point <laughs> if you want to see the beatles go see wings as well yeah. as right. he said <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah so uh you know george has a press conference on the 23rd of uh october in 74 october and says quote i'd rather have willie weeks on bass than paul mccartney that's the truth with all respect to Paul. Now, this is obviously mm. in light of the tour, obviously, mm. that he tour, was going to be yeah. commencing on for the Dark Horse tour. So mm. things are take a, to- a frosty turn again. Well, you also have to remember how difficult a year 1974 was for him, that he, yeah. his marriage his marriage was yeah. finished. The press knows it. He's getting jibes in the press about mm-hmm. how his wife has walked off with his best friend, which, you know, right. which is an, a gross overstatement, under, overstatement considering the, how, ma, how many women George slept with, including Mrs. Ringo right. Starr. And, uh, yeah. uh, but, I mean, that's for, for, you know, for George, he's 31, for a 31-year-old in 1974 to try and take these jibes, it can't have been good, for, easy for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, even if he does deflect with, I'm glad she's with him. Then serve some idiot. He's all, right. <laughs> you know, it's also a time when he's drinking too heavily and he's snorting a lot of cocaine. Uh, Patty mm-hmm. Boyd, uh, Patty Boyd said that the cocaine caused a rift between them. That, mm-hmm. that was one of the mm-hmm. reasons for the breakdown of their marriage. There's many reasons why they they broke they broke down. As, I, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, but uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, we're we're dealing with someone who's going on a tour. He's incredibly nervous he's trying to do something that hasn't been done before everyone's more fixated with the breakdown of his marriage and they're also talking why don't you get back together with the beatles and he probably comes out with that unfortunate comment and it's it's mm. really interesting to see where their careers are at a trajectory here at this point in time in se- late 73 or 74 obviously george is coming off of material mm. world it's great he goes into dark horse as you mentioned kind of goes his marriage kind of goes down mm. his voice is shot the drug use the drinking the womanizing mm. all that and meanwhile now paul is ready to fucking paul is just skyrocketing now yeah. with band right. on the run and mm. this is where things live and let really, die by right, live and let die right. things live really start die. to shift yeah. Yeah. He, yeah he gets an oscar nomination for live and let die he's the only of the he's the only yes. one of the solo beatles to ever get an oscar nomination right so is, this mm. yeah, yeah. Which is but, ironic because George was a film producer in the 80s and he never got an Oscar nomination. No. Yeah. So it, it's just interesting. Like, obviously, Lennon, and, Lennon and, and, and all three Beatles obviously come out of the gate doing so well. Paul yeah. doesn't. Now Paul has to take his lumps, you know, from everybody critically in the press, you know, every, his peers. And now, now Paul's like, ha take a look at me now. now. Take a look at me now. I'm good. Yeah. He's, right. doing, he's doing a Phil Collins on us. He is, <laughs> you know, so, you know, now, okay. And when there's that lovely footage, which we saw, you know, on, um, in December of, uh, 74, when they actually do legally dis- uh, dissolve the Beatles and jo- Paul and George are there together. Paul's in his wing right. shirt and George is going, let the, let this be final, please let this be please. final. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. George, only a brief document or two left. The record, I'd just like All to right. say these are more papers that I don't know what they say. Any of these? Yes, signing. all those. John Lennon, no, 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 Richard Starkey, no, 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 John Lennon, or George Harrison. May the Lord okay. help this to become final. The small gathering on Savile Row is only the beginning. The event is so momentous that historians may one day view it as a landmark in the decline of the British Empire. 
Yeah, I mean, Paul, mm. Paul, Paul looks incredibly emotional. So, all right, come, come on. Mm. He, you know, he, he looks like someone at a funeral who's trying to say, come on, let's, you know, let's, you know, let's, let's bring, bring things up a bit. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And you then, know, and then this it, is where, you know, John's supposed to be there, right? And then you, mm. like you said earlier, Owen, this is really kind of like the, the, the final crack uh, between John and George's relationship because George really wanted or really felt that John should have been there as, as well. Of course he should have been. I mean, it's mm. a. I mean, it's one of these. It's one of these decisions that's inexplicably stupid. It's like Paul in in 1987 when he doesn't come to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I have no issue saying this on camera. What the hell was Paul McCartney thinking, not turning up to that event? Oh, right. We, we've we've talked about that plenty of times. <laughs> right. <laughs> ourselves, yeah. you know. Yeah. 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 That's, but that's the John. You, you, you yeah, drop ahead, ego aside. You 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 know put business aside. Put ego aside. This is, you know, this is should have been for the fans, right? Mm. I mean, all three of them should have been there, standing in one yeah. place, solidarity, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, expressing their love for for each other and the, and the yeah. music, uh, and and that's it. And then, you know, the next day, then you you, you carry on with, uh, yeah, the know, whinging with, uh, with any hard, yeah, the, any hard feelings that you may have. But it's yeah. interesting point you made up there, Owen, with this, the breaking point between Lennon and Harrison at that yeah. point, late 74. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got a nice little clip we're going to cut to because it was the last kind of conversation, interview that they had together right mm -hmm. now. Let me introduce to you the one and only John Lennon. You could just come in and yeah. shout things, talking about the Beatles. What's that? Where are they? Anyway, we... Remember, now I remember this. Right. I remember this. Now we oh, made a record, oh. and John wrote a song which was quite similar. And we did it as an album track and evaded or avoided making it into the next single. And in fact, he gave it to some people who nobody had ever heard of, which was There's a Place. Remember, There's a Place. We gave that away. Da, da, da. <laughs> yeah, but somebody else did it as a single. We just put it on the album, oh. but it was like the one before with the mouth organ and all the bit. Yeah. I a bit about when you change, you know. They attack the Stones, who've just made one of the greatest albums they ever made, and mixing in like the beauty, and saying it's the same old stuff. It isn't the same old stuff, it's great Stones. And if you do change it, then you attack the change in it, right? Yeah. And all the audiences have been digging off his shows, because I've got good spies, and critics don't like it because he changed it. If he'd done the same, he would have been attacked for yeah, yeah. not changing it. There's lots that I really thought were pretty good, and the response which I thought were sensational. Uh, to try and put them into, you know, quickly to say which ones I really enjoyed. I enjoyed uh, things like Strawberry Fields, I, I enjoyed the ones which were inventive, which were new, you know, like I enjoyed Norwegian Wood because I felt where it was coming from. I remember, you know, I mean, I was alongside John or Paul as they were writing things. Occasionally they might have said a line or a word like my mother would say a line or a word which I'd use, but that... Uh, you know, I can think of a million times when I wrote a few lines to, or verses to Alan of Rigby or something else too. They didn't really help me that much. John helped me in as much as he said, he gave me a tip, which wasn't really a tip. He was just um, being, you know, observant. And that is that once you get in the motion of starting it, it's handy to try and finish it, complete it. I remember the day when John did an interview with a certain magazine and said certain things, and then I remember the day when he disagreed with what he'd said, but the man who interviewed him denied him the right to change his mind, and even though it was two and a half years later, still went ahead and published something which John said he no longer agreed with himself on, which means the dream was over, yet certain people wouldn't allow him to have his dream over. No, 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 no. In other words, no, no, no. imagine if somebody, or you accidentally bang your head and you shout, ow, that's the end of it. Right, I mean, it doesn't go on for the next five years, right? And we all do that. Being in parties where 
it's full of people who have got the shiniest shoes or the biggest heels or the funniest glasses or the biggest hat. Now, I can't get on with that scene. I just met David Bowie, who they call Bowie in America, David Bowie, who I know Ringo also thinks is great. So do I. Okay, John does too. Now, you know, I don't have any concepts of whether he's great or not great, but I met him in Memphis, uh, and he was in the shower room with the band just before we went on to the second show. I had to pull John's glasses up and say, let's have a look, let's see where you are. David Bowie, I said these are my very words and I hope he wasn't offended by it because all I really meant was what I said, which was I pulled his hat up from over his eyes and said, hi man, how are you? You know, nice to meet you. Pulled his hat off his eyes and said, you know, do you mind if I have a look at you to see what you are? Because I've only ever seen those dopey pictures of it. I mean, every picture I've ever seen of David Bowie or Elton John, they just looked stupid to me. I thought they looked great. Well, I think he looks dopey. I want to see, you know, I want to see who the person is. First of all, it's immigration for me, George, and Paul. Right? So every time George or Paul want to come here, they have to ask for mission 18 months in advance. Well, oh, I'm a poet. Hang on, okay. Let's hear John's voice. It's possible for more than one or two to get in at the same time. The most that were ever here were me, Paul, and who was the other one? Ringo. <laughs> and a lot of children, and the Emperor didn't come. Right? So just it's impossible for us to get, even get in a room together. So the only way we talk is either over the phone or through some paper. <laughs> So that was that clip I had sent you guys private, you know, uh, on the message, which I think is pretty, pretty historic. I mean, to have, to have that little bit of recorded audio between the two of them. Was there a yeah. purpose for that? I mean, what was the do we know why they did that chat together? Or? I'll defer to Owen on that one. I don't really know. I think it was just a radio interview they did together. Because okay. but it was surrounded around the Dark Horse tour, right? George was already on yeah. tour, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah, and uh, I know there was rumors of John, of you know, maybe you know, going or performing. But I know it was it was around the time of the tour, so John was in New York, yeah. George was in New York, so it was probably that that was probably the, why they they connected there. But that that probably was really it, as you said, between the two of them. Well, it also didn't help that, as you say, that uh, John said he was going to do he was going to he was going to do a cameo at one of George's shows, and then decided not to. And then he, he does all these cryptic messages like listen to this balloon where he sends him a balloon mm. and and we're dealing with someone who's if who's almost at an alcoholic level of this is the amount he's imbibing. George George later George. said Yeah. So we're mm. dealing with someone who's who is at that level of, of fury and anger, who just can't handle it, who's been let down by like his best friend two, two or three times that year. And you know, May Pang writes about about a furious encounter between the two of them, where where George mm. says to him, "I can't see your eyes," and Len takes off his glasses. I still can't see your eyes. And, right. <laughs> yeah. and mm. uh, it's 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 quite unpleasant. But uh, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, even in in 1979, George gave an interview where he said he he said he didn't really spoke, speak to Lennon anymore, but he could hypothesize as to what he was up to. Right. And I love that there's that great recounting of Paul telling, you know, calling with George on the phone, take those glasses off and get over here and sign this thing. Yes. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> you could just you could just hear George saying that to John over the phone, you know? Yeah, of you, course. You, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so the December of 74 is uh, George's show at Madison Square Garden. Paul and Linda attend that concert in disguise. With yes. wigs in disguise. <laughs> Maybe disguise. we should put that picture up too here. Yeah, it well, is pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, we'll put that up in disguise, and yeah. everybody knew it was them yeah. anyway. I'm sure. I'm sure it was. Oh, it's not yeah. the one where Paul's like, oh, yeah, no, yeah. I no, think, I don't think it's that, that one. They're just no, no. they're in wigs. No. They're in wigs, sitting there in yeah. the audience, looking. Paul's straight got at a fake stage. mustache. Okay, on. there, there, there mustache. is one. There's one I saw on Facebook of uh, where they caught they caught Paul and Linda, and he's like, I'm sh mm. yeah, believable. Yeah. You know, but I got to say, yeah. about the Dark Horse tour, you know, there's the first Beatle to tackle a proper solo tour in the 1970s, and that's George Harrison. It's not John, yeah. and it's not Paul. Paul has to wait two more years to come back to America. It, the Dark Horse tour uh, had its failings, but you know what? Bravo to George. To you know, he was like, I I'm going to try to do it. Yeah, he also tried to do it a bit differently. Like he he 
he changed his style of music. You know, he he introduced you know these sitar players. You know, it was it was probably the first example of world music on a on a stage. Like it was ten years before Paul mm -hmm. Simon was doing these similar was doing these you know dance moves with South African musicians or Peter Gabriel or mm. yeah. Uh, we should note that um, that the the Harrison account just or account <laughs> the Harrison estate just dropped on the George Harrison YouTube channel a a um, a bit called uh, from the uh, the Shankar family and friends uh, a bit that they did uh, during the '74 tour. Yeah. This, this this video is the best I think you'll ever see of the image of of that tour. It's just mm -hmm. fantastic. It sounds good. So obviously their the, the work has been done uh, um, on this uh, on this concert footage. So hopefully with this release, hopefully we're gonna see you know more in the future uh, with uh, cleaned up um, you know imagery and and auto uh, audio as well. So I'd love to watch a film from that era. Oh, and I was just going to ask you that if there's something I mean, as bad as that tour was, would you be interested in watching a oh, cleaned you? up, you know, you know, pro shot release or video video of the Dark Horse tour? Yeah, even and including bits with George Grumpley saying saying I'd die for God, but not for rock and roll, and just stuff like that. <laughs> It'd be great. And, and all those, uh, you know, the alternate lyrics to "In My Life," you know, "In My you Life," know, I've I loved love God. In my... Yeah, yeah. Why not? I mean, I mean, it's out there already. Why not see it on the on the glorious sheen? It's like the Get Back series. We all know what happened. Let's just see it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's um, mm -hmm. it's a peculiar tour. It really is. I mean, it's the only tour up until that point before obviously Wings's later success, where George comes in and does a you know a, a tour of the United States. It's it's yeah. uh, brave, and he meets he meets the president. You know, he meets Gerald Ford. He's very visible at this time, even though his life is in his personal life is. And you know shambles. There he is out there, you know, doing a doing a solo concert, supporting an album that you know was not really warmly received. You know, it didn't not not nearly as good as Material World or All Things Must Pass. Yeah. You know, set list wise. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, again, Robert Rodriguez said that maybe he would have been better off doing touring with Thirty Three and a Third. That might have been a better tour. Mm -hmm. It would have been, been a more commercial maybe. tour for one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it's like, you know, George has all these, all things, imagine if he had toured and all things must pass, you know, obviously early in the early days, he could have had a, you know, imagine a set list of, you know, based upon most of that album and then doing mm -hmm. some Beatles songs, but he, he waits a couple of years and then a few albums behind him and a half-assed one, and that's the one he decides to go out and tour, not the most successful, mm -hmm. solo, one of the most successful solo albums of all time. And one that he hadn't finished by the time he had, rec he was still recording it while he was on right. tour. Right, he was still recording it on tour, right, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, That's, that was one of the big things. I see you've got McCartney Legacy behind you, Andy. Yes, yes, of course. Yeah, the yeah. Bible. Did you uh, did you thoroughly enjoy that read? Oh, and oh, it was uh, it was outstanding, and I was very flattered that they they used one of my interviews, which was mm. very very humbling. Uh, yeah. Hmm. yeah, yeah. They they used my interview with Kevin Rowland and the Give Ireland go back to the Irish bit. Oh, fan yes, okay. fantastic. Yeah, and volume two is currently being written. Oh. <laughs> yes. Right. yes. yes. <laughs> I have a feeling that will come out before Mark Lewis's second book comes out. 100%. There's going to be a lot of books that are going to be coming out before I Mark believe Lewis. the soft tentative date is they think the end of 2024 for volume two. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think Mark Lewis's the man. So that's it's a friendly dig. I think it'll, the oh, book yeah. Will come out from there. Oh, yeah, exactly. And my theory is, is he's writing two and three at the same time for the Probably. most part. Yeah, no. which I think is an astute observation. Um, so we're yeah. wrapping up here our initial timeline. Here we've got a couple more events we want to kind of touch upon between George and Paul um, mm -hmm. after the Dark Horse tour. Okay, uh, Wings has released Venus and Mars, and George attends the launch party, which I believe was on the. How many member? Where was that again? Where was the party for Venus and Mars? It was on the on yacht. A, was, on the yacht, yeah. right? That's in LA. California, right? In LA, in LA, yeah. in LA March right. of '75. So after you know Georgia's tour is done, and you know, have the Beatles are it's, done. Uh, you know, where Professor Longhorn, uh, long hair, long sorry, Professor Longhair performs on the uh, uh, live on the Queen Mary. Uh, yeah. I believe that's uh, that's where it was. Yeah. yeah. Um, now so, Patty and George yeah. and Patty are officially split at this point. Yet yeah. or no? Yeah, officially. no, yeah, they they have. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh. It, during during press conferences for the Dark Horse tour, he, he addresses he even addresses on the Dark Horse album that she's left him for Clapton mm. on a uh, Bye Bye Love. So yes, uh, I right. don't know if he I don't know if he and Olivia are together at this point. 
and they may have started they they i think they started seeing each other on the dark horse tour but they wouldn't they weren't officially an item until 75 right uh or so uh, by 76 he's happy to have her on his on his music and his music videos but uh no george and patty by 74 done would you would you agree uh thanks for the clarity. would you agree that george was kind of trying to become part of that laurel canyon stable of uh you know, artists around this time, you know, being in L.A. and kind of being the, the, the guy and kind of being the social and drinking and imbibing. You know, a lot of people that I've spoken to and academics, they kind of feel that George during this point of time was trying to identify himself with the Laurel Canyon stable of artists, the L.A. scene, things like that. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Well, yeah, I mean, you make a very convincing point. Uh, he was certainly drinking a lot with that at that time, and I think Klaus Vorman expressed concern for how much that how much George was imbibing. I know that I know that Klaus and Ringo fell out because of Ringo's drinking. Wow. Mm. Yeah. That 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 Vorman just didn't, Vorman didn't want to collaborate with Ringo anymore. He found him too unpleasant. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Um. Mm. And la our last entry for this first kind of uh, first part of what the, the relationship, we've got a quote here um, on Paul. Mm -hmm. um, actually, no, is it on? Is it from Paul or George? Tom from the Chris from Welch Paul. quote. Yeah, oh, it's from, from it's from Paul. Paul. So it's October. Chris yeah. Welch, who we just had on a few episodes ago. What a nice yeah. bloke! Nice. Great interview. Yeah. Um, it's a, a piece from Melody Maker on George. This is Paul's quote on George seeming to be the most anti-press quote. No, he isn't. George is so straight. He's so straight and so ordinary and so real. And he happens to believe in God. That's what's wrong with George. To most people's minds, he happens to believe in God, you know, which is a terrible crime, and that's so mad. There's nothing freaky about George at all. Some people think he's freaky because he's grown a beard. Old George is, is a grown-up teenager. He refuses to give into the grown-up world. He won't do it. Just because everyone says, you're a freak, you're a recluse. That's a pretty damning quote. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Paul could be just as damning about George as George could be about Paul. Yeah, mm. I, I mean, well, I, I I mean ahead, do you guys think that's? Do you guys think that, or do you think you know Paul is just describing what other people think about George with him believing in God? I mean, do you think that that Paul is saying this as what he believes, or what other people might perceive? No, I, I, I think, I think Paul. I think Paul's being the master PR. He's masking it as other people saying it, but it's actually what he thinks. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it, it's the same Paul who on the Ram album has, you know, two, two Beatles flocculating and yeah. says, oh, nobody, right. I didn't know I was saying fuck Beatles. Oh. Right. Mm. It's, yeah. it's, yeah. um, it, it, it's a really, it's a, you know, that's Paul again saying whatever he wants to say, but putting his little PR spin on it, which only Paul can do so well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, the, the relationship that those these two mm. high guys had pre you know from the earlier days to the end of their life i mean obviously we've got the, the john and paul relationship <clears throat> is so well documented but to look at a deep dive between paul and george throughout all the ups and downs mostly downs throughout their throughout their lives post beatles is an interesting way to look at it and we're going to continue this in a part 2 and easily a part 3 as we get through you know the 80s and the 90s up until george's death um, but it's uh, it's an incredible look at to see, you know, what they've kind of gone through, you know, from their earliest days to you know the height of the Beatles days and then after, in the, especially in the nineteen early, mm. especially in the early nineteen seventies when things were so you right. know you know frictionous at the time. Yeah. Right, but you don't get those like those you know the the back and forth in the press like you did with Paul and and, and John. No, you know, when it comes to you know Paul and George, you know, in a way, yeah, you'll get to get some smart ass comments here and there. But yeah. you, you're not really going to get like that that bitter, you know. I'm pissed at you, so I'm going to let everybody know it. Kind of. Uh, I, I think. Comment. I think the back and forth comes more so in the '80s with um, yes, oh, yes. Oh, he's yes. uptight, and um, yeah. oh, yes. all the good, all the good songs are gone, which songs is an outlandish. Gone. Yeah, right. You know, and I think I think Paul was definitely envious of when we was fab. I think he was totally <laughs> envious of that song. It's a terrible song. Why is he envious of it? I, because oh, he's like, I, I wanted to do that. I think Paul I think Paul <laughs> saw that song and was like, damn, I should have done that. Did return to mm. Pepperland much better. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an, even like, but to go back, like, you know, George gets the invitation to the Venus and Mars, Mars launch party, not John. Mm -hmm. Weird, mm. you know? For as, yeah. for as close as John and Paul well, got together, you know, maybe, you know, George shows up to the party, but John doesn't. 
I think yeah, John but then po- John's back with Yoko. I mean, you know, he yeah. he, he succeeded in his in, in his in his uh, little task with with getting uh, you know mm-hmm. John and Yoko back together, uh, yeah. right? I mean, obviously there he might be pissed off that uh, they didn't end up getting to write together at the beginning of these uh, sessions. Uh, mm. So why would he invite uh, John? Mm. I, also, also at some point in '75, John Lennon told Paul McCartney, "Look, mate, you can't just come around to my house. It's not 1957 mm. anymore. You can't just walk around whenever you want." Mm. So, mm. Uh, by all accounts, that hurt Paul McCartney quite a lot. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, mm. uh, that's gonna cap our our part one dive, I think, into mm. this uh, dynamic mm. relationship. One that does not get looked into nearly as as John and Paul's, mm. obviously. And right. worthy of a deep dive, um, we have enough to at least get us through at least one, probably two more episodes to yep. get us through the 80s right. and 90s and the end of George's life. Mm-hmm. So, um, Owen, why don't you tell us what you've been up to the last, uh, you know, since you've last been on, you know, two legs. Obviously, you've got your book, but what are you, what are you working on right now? Oh, um, well, like George, I have an interest in cinema, so I've been doing a lot of cinema writing. I've had two pieces mm-hmm. with Pop Matters published, which was pretty cool. Uh, Pop Matters are massive. Uh, I I, re- I reviewed Mission Impossible, the new movie, and the Indiana oh. Jones movie, and I've been writing a lot for D movies. Uh, a piece of mine is being republished in a British magazine, so that that's all. I I'm taking a break from music writing and to focus on film writing for the moment. Cinema and stuff. What did you think right. of Dial of Destiny? Yeah. I have not seen it yet. Yeah or nay? Uh, in essential, no. I, okay. <laughs> it's been quoted on Rotten Tomatoes, and it's pretty cool when they say. This many people gave it a negative review, and I'm like, I'm in that group. Is it worse than <laughs> is it worse than the Crystal Skull? I think so. I mean, I think oh. Crystal Skull, Crystal Skull, Crystal Skull at least totally knew what it wanted. It knew what it wanted to be a cheerful, <clears throat> silly movie. Whereas Dial of Destiny is a hodgepodge of different styles in one unsatisfying whole. Oh, mm. that's not encouraging. Yeah. Damn, well, I was looking forward to seeing it. What do I know? But but Temple, I, Temple Temple Dial of Destiny, Project. yeah, Dial of Destiny though doesn't have Shia LaBeouf, you know, swinging from vine to vine with a bunch <laughs> of monkeys. So I, I mean, I, I mean, it's, it's got to be better. You Did know, you see uh, it yet, Tom? No, no, I'm kind of uh, pissed off at our at uh, the lack of uh, cinema viewing uh, with my with the wife and I. But uh, but as you know, we've got uh, bigger fish to fry here coming. You do. Soon, so, you do. Um, um, but, uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mr. Hunyadi, what has been up with you on your channel and uh, Talk More Talk? Nothing. Oh, well, Talk More Talk. Um, what, did, what did we do? Oh, we just had Mark Hudson on talking about the, the Ringo Rama uh, album, which was which was a lot of fun. And I, I think by the time uh, this is uh, uh, posted, we will have uh, 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 um, we will figure out what we wanted to do for the next episode, which is I think we're going to be doing a, uh, a uh, you know, a run, double, run, not, ro- no, I'm sorry, a Russian album, run, double, run, rock and roll type uh, type show where, where we talk about uh, those three, those three albums. And, and we're, uh, John and Paul were at the, at that you know, point in time in their careers doing those, uh, doing those albums. So I uh, look forward to, and I know you're a big, huge fan of the rock and roll album, right, Andy? And I am. Uh, and I've been kind of just kind of a little just taking a break. I haven't done really much on the uh, on the movie channel yet just because I've been watching a lot of movies, but I haven't really been recording anything about films. But uh, if you want to see me talk about some films, go to Tom's movie channel and uh, subscribe, please, and, and check it out. Nice. Awesome. Well, uh, Owen, we'd like to thank you very much for coming on, folks. The book is George Harrison in the 1970s. It's on Amazon, anywhere you want to buy books. It was published last year. It's an awesome, concise look at George's 1970s output. It's not a Mark Lewison book that's going to take you 85 years to read it. It's a, it was a great read. Uh, it opened up a lot of eyes, uh, you know, and ears for me, with uh, you know Owen's opinions on George's music, especially Extra Texture, which is a record that I didn't really just give too much thought about until I read Owen's book, and I'm like, you know what? He made a lot of good points about that record. So, um, well, that's the ultimate compliment. Thank you. Okay. So it, uh, it, it's a really a great look and concise look at George's work in the 1970s with a lot of good facts, great photos. There you go, some Ruddle Land, some Ruddle Land yeah. and Ruddle footage there. You know, great pictures that George was involved with. So uh, Owen would like to thank you so much for coming on Two Legs yet again for a great episode and deep dive into the Paul and George yeah. relationship. We will definitely do a part two at some point in the future and uh, look forward to having you back on. Hare Krishna. Ha, ha, ha.
<laughs> and you'll stay on the label, right? <laughs> I'll stay on the fucking label. <laughs> Well, for Owen uh, and for Tom, this is Andy, and we are signing off from episode 215, and we'll see you all next time. Thanks, everybody. You've been listening to Two Legs, a Paul McCartney podcast. Hosted by Tom Hanyadi and Andy Nichols, with musical contributions by Dylan.